Here are three important tips for aspiring sound engineers. So let's get right to it. Number one, signal flow. Learn about and understand signal flow. Said simply, signal flow is the path that a signal takes from the stage to the mixer, through the mixer and to the various outputs, to the house speakers, the monitors, recording feeds, a stream mix, etc. You want to understand signal flow because this is how you will understand things like pre and post fader sends. It's how you will be able to make routing decisions when setting up a console, understanding how certain things interact both inside and outside of the console, and it will definitely help your troubleshooting skills as well. While signal flow in the big picture is the entirety of the sound system, it's important to look at the nuances of how the signal is routed through your mixing console. We can see by this graphic that the vocal goes from the stage to the console, where it first hits the gain stage of the console. We then can send the vocal to the house speakers, to the monitors, to a stream feed, and of course do the same with all of the channels to create our mix or mixes. Understanding signal flow is how we understand terms like pre-EQ and post-EQ, pre-fader and post-fader. In the case of channel sends, these tap point options work like this. This is a very basic outline of the signal path entering a console channel. A pre-EQ send would tap the signal before the EQ. A post-EQ send would tap the signal post-EQ, after the EQ. With post-EQ, anything you would do on the channel EQ would also go to the post-EQ send. Also, you can see that these tap points would be before the channel fader. Therefore, they are pre-fader. We could also have the option to pick a send point that is post-fader. Therefore, it would get its signal after the channel fader. So not only would it include everything that comes into the channel fader, like the EQ, but it would also pick up the channel fader moves itself. In other words, a post fader send will track with the channel fader changes. That's why when you're doing monitors from front of house, you typically do not want a post fader send. You don't normally want your monitors changing with your front of house channel fader moves. That brings us to tip number two. EQ with a purpose. Sound engineers don't just simply turn the EQ knobs until the source sounds good. We listen and evaluate and identify areas that need to be addressed in the frequency balance and then address them. Usually, we're looking to use subtractive EQ principles first and foremost, de-emphasizing problem frequency areas. And that is particularly true with system EQ. With channel EQ, you still want to listen to remove things first, but there can be times when something needs lifted. You need a basic idea of what each frequency sounds like to know what to reach for. From left to right, bass to treble, low to high. Having a working knowledge of the frequency ranges of various instruments is also pretty important. Then to put this knowledge to work, you need to understand some fundamental terms like these. High pass filter, also called a low cut. A high pass filter gently rolls off lows to take away any unnecessary low end from a source. Almost anything can benefit from a high pass filter being applied. Then there's the low pass filter, also known as a high cut. A low pass filter 
gently rolls off unnecessary high end from a source. A low pass filter is typically not applied to every channel. Since high end doesn't have the same issues as the mud created with excessive low end on sources that don't need it, nor as annoying as vocal plosives on the channel without a high pass filter. Then there is a low shelf EQ. That is an EQ filter that has a knee frequency and then all frequencies below that knee frequency are raised or lowered equally. It looks like a shelf. A high shelf would be just the opposite. A knee frequency with everything above that knee frequency raised or lowered equally. Ideally, you'd want a shelf EQ for coloring the signal, not for feedback control. For feedback control, you generally want tight filters to surgically target a frequency. That would be a place for a parametric EQ, a PEQ. A parametric EQ with its variable bandwidth setting, also known as the Q setting, can be very useful for both feedback control and musical uses of the EQ. Generally, you want narrow for feedback control. Wider for coloring the signal. While a graphic EQ, a GEQ, might seem to be a great option because of all the bands of EQ, it's generally not the best option because it doesn't allow for the precision that a parametric EQ brings to the table. But that said, for system and monitor EQ, some people still prefer it because they are quicker with a graphic EQ. All of this is why digital consoles offer a distinct advantage when it comes to EQ, because they can offer so many options to the operator, without needing to carry racks of outboard processing equipment. That brings us to tip number three. Input gain. All of these tips go hand in hand. With signal flow, the first point you have control over at the console is the input gain. Modern mixing consoles give us metering, either PFL metering or individual channel meters. Both let us see the input levels to the console. We don't have to guess about our input levels in headroom because we can use these meters to consistently set our inputs for each channel, each and every show. But knowing signal flow, we can see that anything we do with the input gain will affect everything in the channel following it. This is extremely important to remember. Change the gain control and you change the level of everything in that channel that follows it. Monitors from front of house will change, stream feeds will change, even that channel in the house will change level when you adjust the gain. That's why we want to adjust the gain as the first point in our sound check or line check. There's also a misconception that there's some magic, perfect, or wrong gain setting that will eliminate or cause feedback. That's simply not true. Volume and frequency levels cause feedback and feedback doesn't care where that volume comes from. The misconception likely gets oxygen because if you're a 3 dB away from feedback and turn the gain up 3 dB, then of course you'll get feedback. And if you turn the gain down 3 dB, then the feedback will go away. But it's not because of the gain setting itself as it might seem if you don't take signal flow into consideration. It's because the gain change affected everything after the gain. If the feedback was in the house PA and you turn the house PA up 3 dB, then you would still get that same feedback, yet the gain control would stay in the same place. Because the channel input level, the gain was not the problem. If you have a flat tire and you put air in all four tires, then you will have fixed the flat tire, but at the expense of changing three other things, 
In this case, the air in the other tires that were perfectly fine all along. It's the same principle. Just like the air pressure gauge tells you what air pressure your tires need, the channel gain needs to be what your input meters tell you your input gain needs to be. The input gain is just optimizing the signal into the console for headroom and consistency with the other channels. This video talks about mixing live vocals. You might want to check that out if you haven't already. Leave me any questions or comments below. If you like content like this, please like and subscribe to the channel. I'll leave links to the Patreon page and more videos in the text below, so please check out the other videos, and I will see you next time.